All right, all right. It is your boy BQ. What is up, everybody? Obviously, I've been doing some uploads the last week or so here on the channel as I make my return. And now we're um, we're officially back up in things and going to be talking about Victory Road. Before we get into Victory Road, I've said this in my last few upgrades. Upgrades. I'm still my I'm still thinking about the uh, production upgrade upload I just did. In my last few uploads. I've just kind of been, you know, delivering my thoughts on things, but there's a clear change to the channel. And before I made my my move from the Midwest to the West, I I had been, you know, saying a little bit, there's probably going to be a rebrand on the channel when I get back. And I wanted to take a little bit of time right now to explain that. Um, obviously, you do you see that this is no longer called the Impact Lounge. It is Negative BQ. That is the name of the channel. Now, the podcast, Reviewing Impact, Talking Impact, it's still the Impact Lounge, all right? We're not completely getting away from the name. It's still the Impact Lounge, but the channel is now Negative BQ, uh, and, and there's just a few reasons for that. Number one, I'm, I'm to the point I think I could stand on my own two feet a little bit with my own brand. Um, I don't really want the Impact name within my brand and within my, my channel. You know, it's one thing to be reviewing the show on a podcast, but, you know, to use the company's name with my own channel, you know, it's it just really time to just stand on my own. And, you know, and frankly, I have no connection to impact. I, you know, once upon a time I had friends there, I had, I knew people backstage. I had wrestlers that were, I considered friends and there was a lot of information I was able to receive for that reason. And like now I'm, I'm, I'm a podcaster. I'm a fan just like you guys, I do not have those connections anymore. I don't have a connection to the company. They've never had a connection to me, to be honest, even though I've had, uh, you know, people that work there who I've been very, very cool with, you know, like impact doesn't fuck with me. They never have, you know, um, I've brought up many times. I'm, you know, I'm not welcome on the media calls and things of that. Nature. Um, you know what I mean? So, um, but the crazy thing is I've done more for impact than any podcaster really has as far as a fan-made podcast. I'm not talking about, you know, Sean Ross Sapp and these guys talking in that or whatever it is. But as far as a fan-made podcast, no one has got to the, the heights and the levels that I have. And I did it once upon a time, you know, falling in love with a TNA product that I thought was so good that someone just needed to talk about it in a positive light. Obviously, I've become more of a critic now. Um, that's where the, the negative BQ has come from, obviously. And I say it all the time. And I have to repeat myself with this. If it's good, I'll say it's good. If it's bad, I'll say it's bad. That's just how I am. I'm not going to kiss anyone's ass. And that's why, you know, they don't really fuck with me. Because uh, I'm going to be honest um, with this kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, I do think I point out a lot of things that are really good. There's a lot of things that frustrate me and have frustrated me over the years to where I've become more of a critic rather than that positive voice. But you can't argue in the grand scheme of things that I haven't done more as a, as a podcaster for impact for TNA in the last six years or so than anybody else has, you know, the numbers have really proved that obviously the numbers have gone down for me a lot considerably the last couple of years, because I've been less involved. Um, you know, so now we're, we're ramping up. You guys are seeing, I've got a little more content coming to the channel. That's not just me talking about the show. And reviewing things. I wanted to review emergence, but by the time I kind of had my internet set up, it just wasn't, um, it was too late. It was like a week later after emergence, you know, and I thought emergence was a cool show, but, um, but yeah, anyway, just having my own brand now within the channel, it gives me a little bit more freedom that, which may not be popular with some of you, I get it. But if I want to talk about NWA one day, if I want to talk about AEW one day, I can do it. You know, it, it it just broadens my horizons a little bit, um, just allows me to talk about a wider scope of things if I want to. Like, it's still going to be very impact centric, you know, 99 percent of the stuff. But if I want to talk about something different now, I kind of have the, the the freedom to do so when someone can't get on my channel and be like, oh, well, you're only supposed to talk about impact. Like, I'm, I can talk about whatever I want. But, you know, again, I have no connection like that with the company, um, which is crazy because I could go to NWA. Uh, to their next pay-per-view and not not pay for a ticket you know i can go there as a media member 
And I don't have that with impact. I don't have that connection. So I'm going to still review it and talk impact because that's what I do. The mission is still the same to have, um, you know, a podcast and a home that that people can come talk about the good and bad of impact. Like the mission doesn't change there at all. But, you know, I'm doing my thing now. I don't have to rely on the like, impact name within my brand. And I'm going to be more consistent talking about some new topics in nature. So uh, I'll kind of explain everything where I'm going, excuse me, uh, where I'm going with it. And hope you're still riding with me. Something new. It might be different for you guys, but still the same good content. And I'm going to try to have some more guest podcasters on with me to vary up um, the opinions on the show. So we're going to talk victory, victory road here. I'm not going to talk this past episode of impact because, you know, normally I'd be reviewing that, but because victory road was the next day. So, you know, some of it's a little irrelevant, but I do want to say that the, uh, Dango stuff has been very good. The, um, the Alicia Edwards stuff. And that's not just me being, you know, playing favorites. Cause you know, I love her. Uh, it's been really, really good. The last couple of weeks, the contract signing was excellent. Um, my, if, if, if I can make, give her a bit of advice as someone who has just uh, done a lot of public speaking or performing with a microphone, she keeps it way too close to her mouth and talks and screams very loud into it. And her volume is much, uh, louder than everyone else's. And it just, it's kind of like a lack of experience because over the years, like she hasn't played a big role on screen. And really when you're talking on the microphone in a, in that kind of setting, you know, there should be a good six inches from your mouth and she's got it <laughs> right up on her lips and she's yelling at the top of her lungs. Um, but no, what she was doing was really good. The dango stuff, very, very good. Uh, as I, as I was on my hiatus, I only like watch it back in the pieces. I think the tag team division is make taking a um, a turn for the best. It's it's a it's kind of there's been a res, resurgence within the tag team division. When the Good Brothers were around, they killed the division, and they they were unable to bounce back for quite some time. Like they're starting to bounce back a little now. Uh, I had only watched one full episode in the last three months, and it was the one where. <laughs> they promoted uh Samurai Del Sol in the main event, like making his impact debut, and then he was taken out and wasn't even on the fucking show. Um, and it was the one where PCO showed up, it's PCO, and I thought the episode was horrible. And I was a little concerned because again, like I said, it was my first time watching this show in a few months. I'm like, fuck, is this where we're at right now? And then the next couple episodes, very, very good. So and then, um, you know, a couple Impact Plus shows that were very, very good. So we're in a good place right now, me and Impact. I definitely have a love-hate relationship with them. But uh, I think we're in a good place right now. For the for the most part, I'm kind of digging what they're doing. Uh, the Kenny King stuff was excellent um, as, as the digital media champion, even though it was a little bit short-lived. Um, yeah, the world title picture, not for me right now. Not for me at all. And we'll, you know, we'll get into that as, as we get into things. So I'm trying to think if there's anything in the, you know, in the company and the show in general right now, that's that I'm liking, not liking uh, MK. Oh, MK ultra is the best thing to happen to the knockouts tag team division, uh, maybe ever, <laughs> but certainly with this version of the knockouts tag team champions and the titles and this, since they brought them back, this is the best thing to happen. They should have the titles forever. Uh, they should never lose them. They should definitely not lose them anytime soon, but they're 100% the best thing to happen to it, um, to the division. And then the crazy Steve stuff, absolutely freaking excellent. X the fucking lint. Um, but it's those little like production things where it's got this great, crazy Steve package. And then whew, the video game whoosh. And it's Tom Hannafin hyping up the crowd. I mean, it's like sometimes the way the show is just put together just boggles my mind. But the crazy Steve stuff, Really good, really great character work. Okay, so let's talk Victory Road finally. Alan Angels, uh, he started off with an open challenge. This is on the pre-show. And, you know, as I said, I'm kinda, I've kind of been watching in bits and pieces, so it's been hard for me to understand. But I know he left the design 
he was kind of getting the baby face. I don't want to say pop, but the baby face reactions, you know, he turns on them and it's very unceremonious. Like, I don't even remember it actually happening. Like they were teasing it. And then one day he just wasn't with, with them anymore. And he's like, oh, you know, Tom Hanford's like, Angel says it. He's no longer part of the design. So I don't know. It was all like a little bit botched. Like it was an opportunity to kind of elevate Alan Angels a little bit as a baby face in the exhibition. And like now he's randomly this heel for me out of nowhere, because it's again, I, again, I've only been watching the bits and pieces, but I, I think I've been seeing enough that, that I can stand by that, that it was, you know, completely out of nowhere, you know? So he shows up here, he is cut in a heel promo. There's an open challenge. Now keep in mind, this is the pre-show where you're trying to, convince people to, to buy the pay-per-view, right? This is where you're trying to get off on your best foot, give people a reason to, to spend their money shortly after this, right? It's Allen Angels, and I'm thinking we're going to get a good X Division showcase type of match, and it is Guido Mariato or whatever the hell his name is, was Nunzio in WWE. They did it to pop the live crowd, um, and you know, he looks like he's in his, his 50s, but I mean, he came out. I had no interest in this. I was like, I don't know why this kind of opening match would entice anyone to sign up for Impact Plus or the Ultimate Insider. That being said, I bring this up a lot. They have never, 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 not one single solitary time on their broadcast brought up how to sign up for the ultimate insider and what it is and what you're paying for. It's just Tom Hannafin for, for our ultimate insiders. He makes it sound like it's this inside group that we, you know, are lucky. Like what's the password? You know, you, you walk up to the club and they open the thing. You just see the eyes. What's the password? New England, New England clam chowder. And then they let you in, you know, like it's this secret society the promotion for it is horrible. So you're sitting here and you're giving us this pre-show and then you're just telling people, okay, on the ultimate insiders, you can, you can see like there's some people who don't know what the hell that is. You've promoted it once. It was the initial press release. And that is it. I would love to see the subscription numbers over the past several years. They have to be like stagnant. I have to believe the, uh, the big group of signups was in the beginning was just that the initial announcement, like that first month. And it, I, would be shocked if it wasn't stagnant ever since. And then Impact Plus, I mean, I would never watch this shit on Impact Plus. I tried a couple times and it was a nightmare. But anyway, um, we get this match with Guido. We see about 45 seconds of it and the feed cuts out because this is Impact and this happens every single month. I would say... 70% of the Impact Plus shows that whatever you want to call them, the monthly specials are very good. But 80% of the time you have audio and visual visual issues. And I'm not talking for 2023, 2023 and 2022. I'm talking about since the effing beginning of 2017, 2018, whenever I started this, it has been a mess almost every single month and on cue. Here it is. We missed the majority of this match. Maybe a good thing. But Alan Angels wins using a move called Angel Wings. And I don't know what it is about some of these wrestlers, Kylan King, Alan Angels. Um, I'm trying to think of some others. They come to Impact after working in a different promotion. And they start using a finisher that's worse than what they were using there. And this is a company I think needs some like cool finishers. And... um you know, like Kylan King had like Kingdom Kingdom Falls or some shit. And now she uses like the pump handle slam. And then the Alan Angels used to have this like a, uh, I think it was like, uh, it, was some, it was some kind of playoff of, of words with clipped wings, like the wing clipper or something like that. And it was a really cool move. And now he's using something that's, I mean, it's a face buster, DDT. It's, uh, We've seen it a thousand times on Impact, so I was, I was a little bit disappointed with that. But yeah, he gets the win. 
uh, nobody after this match signs up for the Ultimate Insider. Um, and then after this, we're getting constant highlights of PCO and, and Bully, which is fine. They're telling a story on this show that Bully is trying to uh, take him out so that the match never happens. And then it shows PCO walking to the arena. No gym bag, no nothing, which would look ridiculous if he was carrying one. I mean, imagine PCO with a suitcase. But he's walking through the parking lot with his face paint. And the cameras just so happen to catch him getting hit by a car. I mean, they have never showed anyone walking from the parking lot like that, parking lot like that before. He just, I mean, wow, what incredible luck to catch this vehicle hitting PCO. So that is the first part of the story that he is hit by a car. Bully is trying to get out of this match. He, he clearly the one who hit him. He gets out of, I think it was like a minivan, some kind of family car. I hope that wasn't his personal because he has no reason to have a rental because he lives out there. Or I, I'd imagine he lives very clo fairly close to there. I could be totally wrong. Uh, what do we got after this? Um, Oh, <laughs> I had a lot. I, I kind of wrote in my notes here. After he hits PCO with the car, Hannafin and Ray Wall are selling it like they're calling the action. And um, that's so funny to me sometimes. Like if, if you're actually hitting someone by with a car and then you're showing the announcing, they should just be like completely beside themselves. But they're just like, did you see that Bully Ray just hit PCO with a car? <sighs> Getting right into things, the next match on the card, you know... <laughs> So we get Moose and Myers. I'm liking what they're doing as well. And they're taking on uh, the team with the worst name and in fact, the ABC. So what is, what is Moose and Myers, the most professional wrestling gods? Uh, the take two of them against uh, the Bullet Clubs, Ace Austin and Chris Bay. Um, good, you know, pretty good match. I, I really enjoy Moose and Myers. Those are just two guys I like to watch wrestle. Like the ABC is not my favorite team. The Bullet Club in general is not my favorite team. Uh, the style of wrestling is not my favorite. I'm a fan of guys who can work. Like Moose can work. Brian Myers can work. And they can do so without having to roll around and flip around and, uh, you know, re-rehearse uh, spots with their with their opponents. Like, hey, we're going to do this cool flippy shit, you know? Um so this was an okay match. This is something I would have kicked off the show with if you're really trying to get some people to to tune into this thing. Um, but I, I don't know that they're serious about it because, as I said, they don't they don't promote the app or the YouTube, and we, we don't know how to sign up. You know, I think they just do it because it's hey, we just got to get a bunch of people on the card, and then they disguise it as a pre-show. You know, they they don't care what kind of signed up signs up it brings. But pretty decent match ended on a. Quick roll up um, by the Bullet Club. Just kind of happened out of nowhere. Whatever. So let's get into Victory Road from there. They're showing a lot of Josh and Macklin highlights because uh, that's the main event for this thing. You know, and I've brought up before that um, I guess every wrestling company does this to an extent, but Impact definitely, when there is a storyline that they're they're going to tell, it doesn't matter what happens in the middle of it. Someone can get hurt. Both guys can get hurt. Like in this case, they're going to tell the story and pick up where they left off immediately. You know, there's no, um, there's no deviation from it. And most of you have heard me use the example, the rich Swan example. He was, he was uh, heated up and then he got hurt. And then they just threw him right back into the world title scene, wins a world title, ice cold. And the people weren't buying it. So, um, I kind of got that with with the Macklin Alexander thing. At um, where did he make his return? It was a Slammiversary. So I did review Slammiversary, and I was saying about Josh at the time, like that, you know, that was really an opportunity for them to change his presentation. You know, he comes out, and uh, I know a lot of you hate my AEW references, but if you are watching uh, Collision this week and Jade Cargill returned. Like she came out, her hair was different. Her outfit was different. She was different. And WWE is really good about that too. You know, I, I remember hearing that maybe it was Pritchard, Bruce Pritchard or something like that talking about a podcast, but like when, you know, someone was injured and they would show up again after several months, like they weren't coming back the person you remember them. 
they're going to change something within this person. And, you know, I thought it was an opportunity for Josh to, to bring him in and, you know, switch up that horrible music, uh, make him look like maybe a little bit more of a star. I know he's like the golden boy of the company, but make him look like a little bit more of a star, maybe change up his look a little bit. <clears throat> like the, you know, the, the ring gear. Because even though he's that guy for Impact, he is not a star outside of Impact. And I think they have to find a way to get there with him. But this was an opportunity to reintroduce him. And he showed up in, you know, a pair of jeans, a t-shirt, and just said, I'm back. You know, it was very, um, very unceremonial. And then we get the first match on the card. It is Kushida with his big red X taking on Leo Rush for the X Division Championship. Now, even though I have said, you know, I'm not a big f- fan of the flips and the rolls, Leo Rush is good, but I love his character work as well. So I can get into some of the chore- choreographed shit if I'm if I'm digging the character, I'm digging the promos. You know, he's been cool as an X Division champion so far. I hope he's able to carry it for a little while because he he just he does really good work he's very entertaining i was not expecting kushida to win this match you know when they were doing ultimate x and the stuff at slam anniversary was just like hey let's let's make all the number one contenders and all the champions someone from other companies or someone that came from another company in an attempt to create buzz and I think sometimes you just got to go with your guys and you just got to trust your guys, you know, rather than, okay, this guy's from New Japan, so we got to give him a title shot. This person came from WWE, so we got to put him in the title picture. So with Kushida, they have continually put him in positions to challenge for the gold. I don't think he's ever going to win it. Uh, but, but you know, he's not a bad competitor. I'm not, um, you know, totally knocking knocking him, but, you know, I just would have rather seen an impact guy in this position versus Leo Rush because we have two non-impact guys here in this match uh, wrestling for the prestigious X Division Championship. And they were doing a lot of match cards. And you can tell Tom, when I say a match card, you know, the tail of the tape things, shows a couple graphics, has some stats. You can tell Tom Hanfin writes these because they're exactly the way he talks. You know, it's a first time ever matchup and, you know, uh, Grace, this, this and this and Slamovich, you know, it's the way he talks about all these things. But they're they're nice little touches, though, because no other company's doing anything like that. You know, over the years, I mean, throughout the years, I should say, we've seen things like that a little bit. But, you know, it's something Impact does that that is um, it, it's a little different. So pretty good X Division match and uh, Leo Rush wins. No, no real surprises there. And then we sh- we get, you know, the next PCO scene. He's with the phony doctor, Dr. Ross, and the EMTs. Um, you know, they show they show the the good doctor with these wrestlers all the time. They did it at emergence when someone took out Taylor Wilde, and he's just on his knees, like, are you okay? Are you okay? Shaking him. There's no checking for range of motion. Um, you know, I, I think they call it like the horizontal gauge in the stagnus what you know like when they put the the one finger in the eye and like watch my finger and see how the you know when the, when the uh when your eye follows a finger like what it does if it's crossing if it's you know shaking whatever there's no assessment at all <laughs> for these they're just like they're just very phony segments i could uh really do without them um but yeah they're trying to you know they've got pco on a stretcher and of course he pops up and he does the PCO thing. Bolle. Uh MK Ultra took on Giselle Shaw and Savannah Evans. And has anyone in this company had more empty fucking title shots than Giselle Shaw? I think she's wrestled. I think she, I, I feel like she's wrestled for the X Division Championship at this point because she she is always wrestling for a title. Never wins. Never even come close. It's not even like a, we go into the field. Like, is this the time Giselle Shaw wins the title? Like, we just know that she is not going to. But my issue with Emergence is that they had this four-way knockouts tag team match. I thought it was unnecessary to feature so many teams. And I, I, I always do. Every time they're like, okay, we're you know, champions defending against six jabrones. Like, 
it's unnecessary because the company is too small to keep throwing these multi-man matches together. And then the next month, you're like, oh, shit, I don't have a damn challenger. And that's what happened here. And there was really no reason last month they couldn't just wrestle the Death Dolls and then then give them the Shantaraj this month. But no, you do the four-way last month, and then the Shantaraj is wrestling for the titles again, even though it's completely undeserved. But they don't have any opponents, right? So, you know, you have uh, the Shantaraj. I didn't want Sean and um, Evans to win. Sound like Hannah and Sean Evans. I didn't want them to win because I want MK Ultra to be the champions forever. Like I want to die before they they lose the titles. I had a good idea with this match where it was going because I think the Sean Evans thing has run its course a little bit. Not not too much. I mean, you you can still get some mileage out of it, but the minute that Tom Hannafin said where he brought up the fact that Giselle Shaw was uh, has a history of going through tag team partners. I was like, that's what's going to happen this match. They're going to break up or they're going to start teasing the breakup. And that's that's essentially what they did, where uh, Giselle Shaw ran into her one, at one point uh, towards the end of the match for the finish. Um, so, yeah, that, that's where they're going with that shit. So I, I think they're going to... I think they're going to feud Giselle and Savannah Evans. I could be totally wrong, but it, I mean, it kind of seems like that's where they're going. But the minute Tom brought that up, it's kind of like, okay, I, I see where they're going with this now. But solid match, um, as, just as everything has been so far. But MK Ultra is just tremendous. Um, Killer Kelly, whoo, girl. Um, yeah. PCO and Bully Ray, again, uh, they're, <laughs> they're now backstage. And Bully Ray is pouring gasoline over PCO. I mean, it is water. It's it's a good old fashioned H two O. There's no oil spill on the ground. There's no nothing. You know, it's it's just water. But it's whatever. It's wrestling. But he tried to pour the gasoline on it, and then he spit it out. The segments are a little silly for me, but I appreciate them telling a story throughout the show. You know, I can definitely dig that. So um, everything that Bully Ray has pretty much done thus far, even though he never wins, has been really good work. I know they signed a Legends deal with WWE. I mean, that's what all these guys ultimately want. They they come to they come to Impact for a booking. You know, people get very mad about some of these guys who come and go, and then they get a, a bigger deal. And oh, why didn't they stay? This is a booking. As much as we wish it wasn't, sometimes for the majority of the people that come through, it's, it's just a, it's a payday, you know, there's no like real brand loyalty to impact. Uh, and now they're showing some of the clips of Tom interviewing crazy Steve, which again, I said was tremendous. It's great to see crazy Steve do this character work. I met Steve in April and I, I shouldn't say I've met him a couple times before, but he's always been with Rosemary. Uh, this time was, he was by himself. And he really, truly cannot see. And it's funny because like he signs his autograph and it's crystal clear. Like he writes crazy Steve. It's not like my my writing's messier and I have perfect vision. But he he writes really well. He um he's kind of a funny guy. You know, he's not he's not like a shy dude or anything. He he's he's pretty cool. He he's kind of a, a good guy to to bullshit with, but I'm really excited for what they're what they're doing here with him because the decay thing didn't work like as cool as black Taurus is. And, and we're going to get into him versus crazy Steve here in a second. As cool as black Taurus is. I don't think there's anyone who doesn't like black Taurus. The, <clears throat> excuse me. Ooh, that just kind of hit me out of nowhere. This version of decay has never clicked with the people. The version, the, the original heel version was what was like one of the coolest things TNA had going and then they you know eventually kind of switched baby face and it was just not it wasn't the same even though you know they had abyss and it wasn't quite the same but it, w- it was still okay where where the K really uh really got hurt was the feud with the Hardys uh the broken Hardys like they did not bounce back from that uh because we didn't like seeing the K lose back then but that's where they really um that's where they start going downhill. And obviously uh, what happened? I think abyss left at that point to go to WWE. 
I don't remember the exact timeline, but they bring, you know, back to gay to K and it's cool. You know, it, it's cool, but they never were serious as like real competitors. You know, I don't know that they won the titles. I don't, I don't think uh, Steve and Tories won it. They might have, but you know, I know obviously the female version, they won and they, they brought in havoc too. And it was cool, but it just didn't hit. Uh, so what, whatever crazy, crazy Steve is doing here now, I am here for it. He takes on his uh, former partner, Black Taurus. And I thought that this match really came off like some of the 80s, 90s tag team splits in the WWF. Where, you know, they split and then they have a match. There was just something about the vibe of this that just reminded me of that. And this was um, this was a good match for me. Um, my guy, Mike, from Breaks for Impact, was saying the crowd was dead for this. I didn't really pick up on that. But... Um, but I, I, this was this one of the matches I was really looking forward to. It was the ones that one that I was really into. And then uh, Steve wins, and and even though it's a DDT that he wins with, and you know me and DDTs, the the Belladonna's kiss name is a great name. I mean, either have a cool name or have a cool finisher. Too many in, people in Impact have neither. You know that's what that is what really bothered me about about finishers. So at least he's got uh, a really cool finisher. And we'll see. Um, we'll see what they do. Where they go with Crazy Steve? Like, who's he going to feud with now that Tories is out of the picture? After that is Tommy Dreamer with this title. I mean, excuse me, his career on the line versus Kenny King, the digital media champion. And I think the majority of the Impact fans were like, I think this is where the road ends for Tommy Dreamer. But I got on Twitter and I said. They're not ending Tommy Dreamer's career on Impact Plus with, with with a match that had a two to three week build. Are you shitting me? I mean, think about that. Really think about that. I know I know a lot of us, and I'm and I'm uh, I'm first one in, in line that is just kind of done with Tommy Dreamer on TV. Like Tommy Dreamer was main eventing Impact three years ago, and he's still very much involved in in the in the show wrestling and wrestling in big matches. And I don't know if I'm not even saying I want Tommy Dreamer on the show. Like, I think there's a place for him, but to be as prominent as they've made him, I think that's where I get lost because it's a company that I think really has to build their own stars, but they feel that Tommy Dreamer is a draw. And maybe he is. I know he brings YouTube numbers. I know that for a fact. I was told that. And then that's one of the reasons he is in the position that he is in, that people click on Tom Dreamer. And Impact is a clickbait fucking company when it comes to social media. They're not trying to give you engaging social media. They're not trying to, to do any original content. Um, they just want you to click. They want you to click on Dennis Rodman. You're not going to sign up or do anything with that click. Uh, and they might get a couple cents off it on, on YouTube. But they're but they're like, hey, click on content. They're that type of company. So they're content with what Tommy Dreamer brings as far as that goes, you know. But Impact Plus, let, let's face it. There's there cannot be more than five thousand people watching these shows. Maybe ten thousand on, on like a really good, you know. But I I, I don't think they have more than 10,000 subscribers on that. I know some people will argue like, no, I, you know, they probably have like a hundred thousand. There's not a hundred thousand people watching the show. So you can't tell me that they have that many paid subscribers. So, you know, like honor club has about 10,000 people. You know, I really think impact plus is in that ballpark and maybe half of the people watch these shows. They're not going to end Tommy, Tommy dreamers career. Um, against Kenny King, who I love Kenny King, but let's face it, it's not going to be versus Kenny King, and it's not going to be a match that has a two-week, three-week build. They had his family there. I mean, they they really played it out like there was a possibility. I knew there was no chance he was losing. With Impact 1000 coming up and Bound for Glory, I mean, really, they're going to end his career at Victory Road? Come on. So Tommy Dreamer is the new digital media champion. Penzer needed a card to let everyone know that he was from Yonkers, New York. My dead grandmother knows that Tommy Dreamer's from Yonkers, New York. I mean, my God, folks. But yeah, he, 
you know, Kenny King was was doing really good as the digital media champion. Champion. I think he's going to get it back. I don't think that Tommy Dreamer is going to have this like run with it. Tommy Dreamer may lose it the next time he defends it. You know, but they had to get him out of this because they. I don't think it's one of those like next time he loses thing. He's going to retire. I think it was just strictly versus Kenny King. So they need to get him out of that that stipulation so that they can put him in the main event for glory, whatever it is um, that they want to do. I thought Kenny King, well, first of all, Tommy Dreamer was wearing pants. Like, I don't know if that was some kind of tribute to Terry Funk. They, they look like you know, my curtains. He took, took my curtains down and made some pants out of them. Um, the, 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 the part where Kenny King super kicks him and says, I'm sorry, I hate you. That was awesome. And then, uh, but Tommy Dreamer wins with the Dreamer Driver. I've never heard it called the Dreamer Driver, the Death Valley Driver. Everything the fucking driver, the, the Pentagon Driver, whatever the hell it was called when he was around. <clears throat> Excuse me, the Great Driver, the Dreamer Driver. I mean, have some fucking originality. So Tommy Dreamer wins. He, he's the uh, he's your guy. He's the, he is the champion now. He helps him win this match. Heath is uh, – I knew Heath was getting involved with this. I, I, I actually thought there was an outside chance that he tossed Dreamer the match. But, no, they went you – know, the safe route was Heath coming in and taking the heel out. And one of these days, if, if Heath takes out the baby face, it's going to get a real reaction. Heath is actually kind of over with this company. He's been with them forever since that slam anniversary where they're teasing, you know, all these guys coming over. Heath has been around – that entire time, he's the only one that hasn't gone anywhere. And he is getting an easy paycheck from Impact because this dude does not fucking wrestle. He's not in tag team matches. He's not in single matches. He's barely even cutting promos. He just comes in and hits the wake-up call, collects his paycheck. So much respect there. Then we get um, Deanna versus Jordan. And I called it the Grace Driver. It was called here the Juggernaut Driver. It, <clears throat> excuse me again. I don't know where this like Juggernaut name came from. They just started calling her that one day out of the blue, and people are like, "Well, they've been calling her like that, calling her that for years." And I'm like, I don't think it's going. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But I don't think that's been going over my head for several years that they announced her as the Ju- Juggernaut every time. That shit came out of nowhere. But Deanna versus Jordan. You know, two of the best to ever do it in the history of Impact's knockout division. Uh, Deanna is the real knockouts champion, by the way. I will refer to her as the real knockouts champion, and Steve Macklin is a real world's champion going forward. But is the real knockouts champion, Deanna Perrazzo versus uh, Jordan Grace. This is my issue. The match is great. The match is always great with these two, always. I don't even have to review what the hell they did. But this was my issue with the match even being a thing was that Jordan went away for a long time. And then, you know, they made her think like she had to rethink things. We even know she was coming back to impact, but she's something like Owen four versus Deanna. And Deanna just, just dropped back to back matches. The Trinity. Deanna. Deanna will never be buried, but Deanna was in a position where she probably should have got a win after those losses with Trinity. But they put her in this match with Jordan Grace. You know Deanna's not going to win. But they had such a great story here that the great Jordan Grace cannot beat her. What a great story. That Deanna owns her. In in this era of 50-50 booking, back and forth, I get a win, you get a win. Jordan has not been able to beat her. And what an incredible story they could have told long term. It would have been better if Deanna had the title. But something where you like really build into it like, hey, she's she's going to do it this time. But instead, it's just like, hey, she's returning. It's going to be against Deanna. They, they just picked up where she left off. So I thought the win did not mean anything. I shouldn't say it didn't mean anything. It didn't mean as much as I really could have because there was a complete lack of build. And you could argue maybe it's a story that doesn't need a lot of build, but 
for this particular where you're trying to go with it, I don't think it hit the way that they thought it would where Deanna, where Jordan finally beats Deanna and then she's like ready for what's next, which is clearly Trinity. But um, I don't know. I, I like, I'd like to know your guys' thoughts on that if you felt this was the time and place for Jordan and Deanna to wrestle again and if it was a time and place for, for Jordan Grace to win, which she did with the juggernaut driver. Uh, this was not a first time of her matchup. And then we get PCO versus Bully. I'm not going to bullshit you. I paid zero attention to this match. The minute they start showing the tables and all this shit out there, you guys know me with these hardcore matches. Anything goes. Like Jim Cornette says, lazy booking. And why does he call it that? Because it's an easy way to get out of everything. But my issue with it is you're putting a guy through tables. You're hitting him with chairs. You're stapling his freaking nutsack to his inner thigh. You're using mace. And it takes all this to beat somebody. And then in the next match, someone's winning with a DDT. So the person before this is able to kick out of all this going through furniture and getting hit with weapons and bleeding. But then in the match, it ends with a DDT. It ends up with a clothesline. Some of these weak finishers that some of the impact guys use. So I paid zero attention to this. PCO wins. Okay. Hardcore match down. Then we get the rascals versus the motor city machine guns. Another good match. This is one of the matches that people would think, oh, this was match of the night. Um, not for me because I don't like the choreographed tag team stuff. But I'm interested in what Trey Miguel's doing. I'm interested in what Wentz is doing. I kind of wish they weren't the, weren't the Rascals, though, because I didn't like the Rascals, the babyface tag team. I know everyone really liked them. I didn't. I don't like the hand under the thing gimmick. I don't think it's necessary for this heel work. But they still do it. It's whatever. It's it's nitpicking because they've been very good, very entertaining so far. Um, and they're another team that I hope has the titles for quite some time. I don't know where they're going with it. I'm trying to think what's the other tag team. Is it is it the Bullet Club again? Because because uh, I know the Good Hands came out earlier and tried to cost them the match. So is it just another collision course with them? I don't I don't know. But Rascals versus Motor City Machine Guns, a uh, pretty solid tag team match. Chris Saban takes the loss. I, I thought the thing that was an interesting story here was that what if the Rascals win and what if they beat Alex Shelley? That's kind of an interesting wrinkle. I think that if that happened, everyone would have been very mad, though, because we don't like to see champions get pinned in non-title situations. But that's kind of an interesting wrinkle that could have, could have got thrown into this. What if Trey pinned him? And then Trey gets a title shot after that. And you 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 get you allow Alex Shelley to get his win back and then and then heat him up a little bit from there. But that way you you kind of preserve things um and make a world title match that we know Trey's probably gonna lose, but it just puts him in a good position. But you know, I also think that um Alex Shelley shouldn't be portrayed as a tag team wrestler right now. But that's what they're doing. They're going to let people know they are the Motor City Machine Guns. That is a brand that is important to them. They're not going to get away from that in any way. But uh, the right team won here, the Rascals. Then we got Trinity versus Alicia, and they did a tale of the tape. This is what I was really looking forward to, and I'm glad this didn't happen after PCO versus Bully. Because, as I said, with a hardcore match, you do all this thing, still can't beat them. Well, the Rascals Motor City Machine Guns, kind of the same too using tandem moves and flips and dives and, and just up the ass and can't beat the person so it it works to go after pco versus bully but they do this tail the tape thing and it says alicia has a finisher finisher called delish and i'm like i'm the biggest uh alicia edwards fan in the world i have no clue what the hell this move is now i've known though that she's used the flatliner as her finisher on the indies she uses it in impact for almost every match, but they, it gets kicked out of. So this is, it is the worst protected finisher in the company. Just pay attention next time she's wrestling. Well, now she's a heel now, so it's different. But when she was a baby face, she was always hitting it and it would kick out of it. 
And then she had a finisher for one match that was like a neck, neck breaker, which is kind of odd because she's five foot tall and you got to be a little taller or the same size, the same size as your general opponent to do this move. Cause it was kind of like the rude awakening neck breaker where for one match, she had the neck breaker. And then for one match, she had the sit out face buster, which is the worst move in professional wrestling. And I was so upset that she did that. But I thought, as I said, the promo she did on the previous episode of impact, that whole segment was tremendous. Uh, she's really coming into her own when she dials that Boston accent down a little bit, because that is frankly the worst accent in the world. When she dials that down a little bit, and if anyone has that accent listening, I apologize. Just my opinion, right? But I just offended you, so I'm sorry. But when she dials the accent back, she does a lot better talking, and it sounds it sounds better, but she's doing some really good heel work right now, like really establishing herself as a good wrestling heel. And, and bringing it, the best out of Eddie, too, because Eddie, to me, has not been a good heel. But what they're doing here is a tandem. It's, it's been kind of working. So um, I'm looking forward to, to you know, what they do going forward. I knew Alicia wasn't going to win. This was a throwaway match. But the way that they did that contract signing made you think, like, yo, Alicia might win this thing. But we know Bound for Glory is coming up. We know there's Jordan Grace. We know Mickey James is returning. And you probably still have a wet dream that you can get Mercedes Monet. And, you know, Alicia's not going to win the title. So we, we know that that wasn't going to be the outcome. But it was a good story because it was kind of like, hey, she's, you know, I've never gotten this shot. I'm just Eddie's wife, which is exactly what I've said. They just portrayed her as. And uh, she gets this title shot. And Alicia has an updated look. Which I think I wish Eddie would do because he Eddie just tries to have ridiculous haircuts and think he's going to get booed because of that. When he first was a part of Honor No More, like go back to the Why Eddie promo. He completely changed his look, his colors. And everything, and then he went right back to what he looked like as a baby face. So I appreciated Alicia like really updating her look and just glamming it out and really going over the top and and, and being obnoxious with it. So she's doing some good stuff. I felt like there was the potential for this to be the worst knockouts title match in a really long time because neither of them are actually that really good wrestling. Uh, so Trinity is all star power and athleticism, but she's not actually very good. And then Alicia, you know, has her limitations, but I've always said when you put her in a match that matters, she does a pretty good job. When she's just there to be a jobber, to lose in two minutes, she's not She's not typically going to look really good. But anyway, yeah, the the flatliner was the, the, the delish for, for those uh, keeping score. You know, and I, I thought in the back of my head, too, they weren't going to have a match match. I thought that was a pretty good possibility that there was going to be some shenanigans and there was, and there was Tracy Brooks and Kazarian and a table and a table that didn't break for that matter. But, you know, I thought that, I thought the match was, was okay actually. Uh, but I, but I do, I do think Eddie and Alicia are doing a good job of getting heat right now, like in this wrestling world of, of no one getting heat. And then, uh, then we finish it up. Josh Alexander, Steve Macklin, you know, Good match. These are these are guys who can work, and and I just I enjoy guys who can work. I just do. That is that is just the type of wrestling wrestling match that I am into. I don't need a thousand near falls and it's just like crazy spots. You know, like just some some good old fucking hard hitting wrestling by by some big dudes uh, who are selling and they're registering things and they're they're telling a story and you know. Uh, so they they told a good story going into this. And I make fun of Tom Hannafin a lot for this first time matchup shit that he does, but he does it so much that it ultimately, when it got to this point, it meant nothing. It meant jack shit. And this was one of the biggest parts of the story is that we never seen these two fuckers wrestle. This was the match we were supposed to get. Josh gets hurt because they were having him wrestle multiple 45 minute matches on free television in in bouts that he's going to, we know he's going to win. And then Steve Macklin unnecessarily having a rematch with um, Alex Shelley that went entirely too long. He gets hurt and we've just never got this thing. And they, they, the story was, you know, we're going to pick up where we left off. Like I said, that's what they do. Pick up right where the fuck, the fuck they left off. But 
to sit here and just first time ever matchup. It's it's the good hands versus fucking Shing and Sarah. Like when you beat a dead horse on things like that, and then you actually need that for the story, means nothing. Means absolutely nothing. He used it multiple times on the fucking show. But meant nothing. But this, um, you know, Josh Alexander won. We knew he was going to win. We're going to see on this next episode of Impact that's going to kick it off with slow motion C4 spike. Uh, that's always, you know, it's a, it's a safe bet. And they're trying to go Josh Alexander versus Alex Shelley at Bound for Glory. That, that's clearly like the direction they were going. I would really rather than put Will Ospreay in this match, even if it's a three-way, which I don't want it to be a three-way, but uh, I don't think the two of them can sell this on their own. Like Alex Shelley and Josh Alexander, neither can talk. They're both very bland. They're great wrestlers, but they're very bland, and the story is not going to be good. And Josh Alexander's promos are always like, I, you know, I cry, scratch and claw for this business, and I, this and the, you know, like. I just don't think what they're going to be doing is very good. And I would really throw Will Ospreay into this to liven it up and, and have it mean something. But I'm sure Josh is going to win here. I still don't understand why Alex Shelley is the champion. I don't understand the point of it. Uh, Macklin should have been a champion this entire time. There was so much they could have done with him. So this title reign isn't working for me. It would have meant more for Josh to beat Macklin, to be honest, instead of a uh, match that means nothing at Victory Road because it's not like a one, one number one contender match or anything. They could have at least done that. They could have they could have thrown that stipulation on it, and maybe they did, and I didn't catch it, but I, I don't believe that they did. Um, but Josh wins. We knew he's going to win. the The matches for this whole thing were pretty predictable for the most part, but they put on a good show. Victory Road was good. Emergence was good. Like they they they're doing some really good stuff, and uh, we'll see what's next. I don't remember what the next one is leading up to bound for glory. Cause I think they're still going to do one, the month of bound for glory. I feel like every pay-per-view they still do the, the monthly special, even though I think it's overkill personally, but, um, but good things are happening and bound for glory should be really cool. I just don't think this is the main event that people are going to give a shit and, and buy the pay-per-view for. I, I don't think so at all. So I'm hoping that Osprey who can cut a promo and make people care. And he has star power. Like I hope he's factored into this because I don't know, who also would have him wrestle otherwise? Like, okay, Mike Bailey, but Mike Bailey can't talk either. So, you know, put Osprey into some kind of angle where he can really, really elevate it. That's going to do it for me. Um, little under an hour, little under five, 55 minutes. Uh, thanks for checking me out, guys. We're, we're, we're back here on the channel, talking impact, and uh, we'll be talking uh, the weekly show again here very, very soon. So uh, I am your boy, BQ. And I'm out. Peace.